Hi there. Welcome back to story time. Uh, let's see. So yes, we are in Exodus, the book of Exodus, and we are past the whole, we had to skip over the whole Exodus event because none of the passages in that story actually pertain to this filter. So again, this is story time related to reading passages from the Bible that relate to the themes or talk about sex, the relationship we call marriage, and any events and stories that talk about narrate, whatever, um, physical abuse, physical harm that involves intimate body parts. And that particular wording is because I don't like saying sexual and assault next to each other. I think of sex as a good thing and assault is a very bad thing. And so I don't want to use that phrase to refer to what I'm trying to talk about. And so there's that clarification. Um, yeah. So I will admit I have a lot of things going on in my mind. I have um, have some moving issues potentially going on in my life and uh, helping some people move and also my own book, which is exciting. It's very exciting, but I have the proofs back. So we're at the place of um, with the place of reading the proofs and doing the indexing. I don't know if any of you have done that before. I imagine there's some people here who have, or at least you've heard others talk about it. So um, it's kind of a fun little adventure, two weeks to get the indexing done for my book. That's kind of fun. So it's actually kind of nice to come do this for a little bit. Come into this little zone and think about, okay, let's talk about some things from the Bible and just talk about this for a minute. And that's kind of fun and easy. And so here we go. We have, um, yes, we started Exodus. We talked about Moses a little bit. We talked a little bit about the issue of midwives and the role of women in these stories and actually how central they are to these stories. But really, I want to make sure to direct our attention back to this primary filter of the way sex plays out, the way marriages or those relationships that we call marriage are talked about, and any kind of um, abuse of people related to intimate body parts takes place. I have to be honest, I actually had a dream about this the other night. That's kind of awkward. You know, when you're really into something and you, you kind of dream about it or you work some of it out in your dream. I think I woke up with this sense of trying to figure out how to like a new way or new, yeah, a new avenue to invite you to consider the implications of what's being described. And I think it was anticipating what's coming up here, which is today and then the next couple days of story time, which will be, we're going to just read through the, the 10 commandments. I put 10 in quotes because they're numbered differently depending on which tradition you're a part of. Um, I'm going to, sh I'll show this to you in just a second. So we're going to talk about the 10 commandments today. And then the next two story times, we're going to read through the, the laws in the next couple chapters. So kind of more, not just the top 10, but the groups of laws that come right after that in Exodus chapters 20 to 23, or actually 21 to 23. Uh, but let me just show you this. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, scan it into a PowerPoint or something. Let's see if you can see it at all here. Let's see. Um, but this is a, let's see, I always try to get this back. I always get this backwards. So you can see that the 10 commandments are actually numbered differently, uh, depending on whether you're Jewish or Protestant or Roman Catholic, though everybody agrees that number 10 is number 10 and that number one is number, no, but they don't even all agree that number one is number one. So that's, that's the thing. It's like, okay, uh, yeah, what everybody agrees on is number 10. <laughs> interesting in and of itself, because we're going to get to that in a second. So anyway, so we're doing the Ten Commandments, the initial suggestions, strong suggestions about human behaviors, and then we're going to do the other laws. So I think in my mind, I was like, okay, I've said this 500 times already in story time. What's a new way to invite you all to think about what this is telling us about the way people behaved, right? What does this tell you about the way people like went about their daily business, 
and the way they in general related to each other and the way they talked to the woman they may have purchased as their wife and the way they talked to their children who may have been male or female in their in the orientation of thinking of things as binary again i think of humanity human experiences and expressions as beyond a binary but i'm just talking about what we what we have to look at here right um what what do these things tell us about how they went about their business, how they thought about themselves, the whatever anxiety or pressures there may have been on the men because it was all hanging on their shoulders, right? Not also not helpful or fair, right? All the different things, and I'm I, there's this part of me that I I continue to think about today and people I watch or observe. Um, whether it's just people at the coffee shop and the way a couple, a hetero couple might interact, or if it's lawmakers in, in some sort of video or, or an article in the paper or uh, people that I swim with, you know, on the swim team and like we're at a swim meet together and I'm watching families interact. Like there are things that permeate the way we live that we can see happening in some of these context like we can see claims being made that set the stage for a bigger mess that people then feel compelled to live within right or to conform to right so i'm just going to leave with that and keep, and keep going at this point so i'm going to start so i hope that helps that i'm every time i do this and every time I say something that I've already said before, that you've already heard before, that you've already known, and you've thought of a million times, instead of saying, yeah, 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 <laughs> right? I would invite you to consider, to take it seriously, that this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is how it is. We get it. We get it. No, no. I want you to take that really, really freakishly seriously, okay? Um, how are people internalizing whatever. So, so we're skipping over the Exodus story, all the plagues, all the things that they complain about in the wilderness afterwards. And now we're at chapter 20 with, um, chapter 20 and we're in the desert and we have, um, go, we have Moses interacting with the Lord on Mount Sinai, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I feel like I always need to do like leading into this. Um, we have, what do we have? Moses is talking to the people on the, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning as well as a thick cloud on the mountain and a blast of trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, while the whole mountain shook violently. It's like a volcano. As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak and God would answer him in thunder. When the Lord descended upon, upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. That takes some, that takes some courage, right? Go into a thunderstorm. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look. I, I love this kind of stuff, right? What? Don't look behind the curtain, <laughs> said the man in Emerald City, right? Otherwise, many of them will perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people are not permitted to come up to Mount Sinai for you yourself warned us saying, set limits around the mountain and keep it holy. The Lord said to him, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let either the priests or the people break through to come up to the Lord. Otherwise, he will break out against them. I love the way the narrative works and then doesn't work all of a sudden. Um, all of a sudden, the Lord is speaking of himself in third person. That's okay. So Moses went down to the people and told them. And here, that's the lead up to chapter 20, where then the Lord, then God, 
which is different than Lord. So this is where those the scene we see seams in the narrative when you're trying when they're trying to blend together the different storylines, right? We have one from what people might refer to as an Elohist tradition and Yahweh's tradition. And yes, this whole idea of the um uh, the JEDP theory, theory about where we get all the biblical passages for the Torah, like that's being revised and that's great, but we can still see that there are stories attributed talking about God as God and other stories talking about God as Adonai or Yahweh. Um, so chapter 20, then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God. This is a very male God, by the way. I just want to be very clear about that so that when people say that God can't be talked about as female, there's a part of me that agrees with them because the biblical God is very male. Like it's an exception for God to be depicted as female. The people, their thoughts, the way they saw the world, all of that. Yeah, he's been, God is talked about as male, very male and very violent, very all kinds of things that I don't necessarily ascribe to all males, all that kind of stuff. But it's important to note, right? For people who want to reject the idea of talking about God as plural or they instead of he or she or non-binary. I love that theoretically and in terms of theology, but biblically speaking, you're going to have a hard time convincing me, right? And that's why we need to talk about the difference here. So, okay. So I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is heaven that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents. Because that's really just to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Why aren't you on board? <laughs> I'm not on board because that first part scares the shit out of me. <laughs> Let me, okay, good, okay. Sorry about that, I unplugged myself, wanted to make sure everything was still tracking. Um, I do, I keep wanting to do just regular commentary because people talk about this stuff all the time and, and there's, I get really wound up because I see a lot of people in kind of a semi-popular, popular space trying to redefine God, but they're not doing it systematically or like really thoroughly and thoughtfully. And I just, I really want to help people redefine God. Um, anyway, so, so when people, yeah, reading this, I, the Lord, your God, I'm a jealous God that there's no way around that in terms of making that nice or sweet jealousy there's just nothing in jealousy that's healthy or helpful in any kind of relationship. And so, yes, this is a human trait that, that people are projecting onto God. And I think it's really important to be able to see that and say that instead of finding a way to make um, a divine being who is thought to be really powerful and almost, almost omnipotent, um, and we don't want to justify that. I don't, that's just not healthy. That is not helpful in any way, shape or form. And it leads to people justifying jealousy in their human relationships. And that is not healthy or helpful. Um, that's just lazy, actually. It's understandable if that's your reaction, but then get to a healthier place and deal with that shit. Okay. And don't, and stop saying, well, God is a jealous God, because that's, that's really, that's just very immature. Really? Can we just call it what it is, right? Very immature. And I think, you know, it's it's like um, <clears throat> people keep talking about God as a parent. And so that means that humans are the children of God and you never get a chance to be an adult of God. So 
I think you need to be an adult of God and, and make sure that the God, if you are into God, that the God that you're talking about and worshiping is actually mature and actually worth your worship and um, emulating it. Right. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So I've just read through verses one through six of chapter 20 and <clears throat> excuse me, and different churches, different, both churches and Jewish tradition. So the Jewish tradition calls that command one and two. And in a different way, um, Orthodox and Protestants call it one and two. And Roman Catholic and Lutheran call that all the first command. Isn't that wild? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to stop doing the little breakdown for you, just so you know. But I just wanted to point that out about scripture and about this whole thing about when we talk about a thing, we need to be really clear what it is we mean by that thing, because different traditions even that read the same thing, think about it differently. <laughs> all right, let's keep moving. So on, onward, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. <sighs> yeah, I, I, I'm pausing because I want to comment on what I said just a second ago and extend the commentary here. People become like the God they worship. And if you think of God this way, then you're thinking of what that means is the best behavior in the world is being emulated by God. And someone who will not acquit another for an offense, that's just, that's just not, that's not what I, I don't think that's what most of the people I know teach their children. Right. I think that we t we actually teach people to forgive an offense or even let the offense just roll right off of us because it says more about the person saying the offense than it does about us. And that's on them. And you don't have time to deal with everybody else's shit. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but for children, we need to talk about it. Right. We need to talk about like, OK, somebody said something that was inappropriate or hurtful. Let's talk about that and not. And so that you can get beyond it so that it's not dwelling in you. Because really, forgiveness is about yourself so that you're not stewing with all this bile, right? Um, <clears throat> so I certainly understand what's being done here. They're trying to make a very important thing about their God. But it is, it is just really distasteful to me how many parts of this are really harmful and unhealthy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female enslaved person, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. I... I really appreciate that someone showed me that this can be seen as a command to the Protestant work ethic inheritors to take a freaking day off. And then it can be seen as a promise to those who are seeking enough work to feed their families. Just a little, little side nugget there for you. <clears throat> Do you know what I'm saying? If you're struggling to feed your family and pay all the bills, this can actually be seen as a promise that you'll even though it doesn't just work like that, it's not magic, but it gives people hope who need hope in terms of finding enough employment. <clears throat> Honor your father and mother. But there's also the flip side. I just need to point out, right? Like the whole, this isn't, this doesn't take into account people who have to work multiple jobs in order to pay all the bills and therefore taking a day off is actually not possible for them. That was my reality for many years. I had to work every day of the week, always constantly. And I would have loved to have had a day off. Um, so there's, the, so I, I guess this is my point here. This isn't about <laughs> the filter of sex, marriage, and abusive dynamics. Um, these are really great in some sort of a specific ideal, but the nuances and the realities of people's lives need to be taken into consideration. And um, that's that's what I try to invite people to to keep in mind and to think about. Same with the next, same with the next one. Number five for most people, though not for everybody. Um, 
honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And for your parents, if your parents are awful, you know, are, I don't know, if your parents are sociopaths or narcissists or are, you know, addicted to substances, you know, I think that honoring them needs to be removed so that you can, so that you can take care of yourself and thrive because, um, you know what I'm saying? I didn't mean to do all these little sidebars, but it's kind of hard not to as I'm reading through it. You shall not murder. Um, big conversation here about which verb form are we using? Because do they just mean murder in general? Do we mean do not and you know the do not plot to kill your neighbor? Is the intent is the type of verb meant here? So that's why people get get around this whole issue of well, God says not to kill, but then God also tells to go kill everybody in Joshua, right? Because that's a different kind of a situation and a different verb. I'm not trying to justify it, by the way. I'm just trying to point out that part of what's going on here is this in context is a set of rules for how to live amongst each other and live together. And it doesn't go well at the, you know, the weekly picnic, you know, community picnic, if you're trying to plot against your neighbor, right, to kill him or her. Uh, that's different than in this framework, claiming land that you believe the guy gave to you and therefore going to battle over it. Again, I'm not trying to justify the claims or the promises or murdering anyone, but I am trying to say that this is a particular low context type of action, still awful. There's no way to justify it at all, but that's why it's not enough to say, God says not to kill, but then tells people to go kill. That's not, that's actually not actually super smart. That's not very thorough. That's not very, that's a cheap angle at undermine at when people try to undermine or say, see, the Bible is silly and ridiculous. That's actually, I think a, a cheap shot. It's not, those are different. Those are different things in different contexts. You shall not murder. It's a good idea, right? Like I said, the the weekly community meal does not, this is a little bit tense when you're trying to plot to kill your neighbor. You shall not commit adultery. Let's talk about this. What is adultery in a biblical context? So we're talking about commands that are be, being given by men to other men, right? This is about men. This is all about men. This is about men and men's needs and property and claims. That's that's what this is. Nobody's expecting women to be listening to these commands. They're not actually talking to women. They're not actually talking to the wives, air quotes, who belong to the men. They're not actually talking to the children. They're talking to men about the way the men behave with each other. That's what this whole all of this is about that, okay? This isn't talking to the women. Women are property. Women are property. So women are amongst the things that count as property. And when you say you shall not commit adultery, what's being said is, you don't get to go and have sex with someone else's man, with someone, some other man's woman. <laughs> that was a funny slip, right? You don't get to do that. That's not allowed here. And that's what adultery is. A woman already belongs to another man and you go have sex with her. The status of you as a man and the number of women you may or may not already own is irrelevant. We're not... We are not talking about protecting a sacred bond here. We're not talking about people who've taken a vow and, and committed to each other. That has not happened, folks. That has not happened. That isn't happening. It's very clear that it's not happening because we have laws all over the place saying, don't have sex with these women, but that's, that's the boundary. So you can have sex with all these other women, just don't have sex with all the women you'll see at a family gathering, right? So when it says do not commit adultery, this isn't, this isn't coming out of this deep respect for marriage. That is not what's happening on this, with this law. Okay. This is about go to the level of community 
how do we live well? How do us men live well together and respect each other and get along? And how do we do that well together? And <laughs> whatever. I'm it's bad, stupid generalization of men. I'm just trying to make a point here. This isn't about sacred, holy relationships. This isn't about what God is ordaining because, because women are listed, actually listed as property in number 10. Okay. Don't commit adultery. Don't go sleep with, don't go have sex with someone else's property. That's what that is. That's all it is not making grand gestures or representations of what God thinks here. Okay. You shall not steal. Good, good advice. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Also good advice. Cause that comes back to bite you in the ass, right? Also just good in general, good advice about how to be a moral person, but that's, you know, but these are, these are some bare minimums that they're laying down for the community, right? For the men living amongst each other and together. And then the final one, the one number 10, the one that everybody agrees is number 10. Although for some people, <clears throat> um, it's 17. It's seven, for some people, verse 17 is broken down into two different commands. You shall not covet your number, your neighbor's house is the first is command um, number nine for Roman Catholics and Lutherans. And then you shall not covet a whole other set of property as number 10. But um, the tradition I grew up in and the tradition that um, Ju the, the tr general tradition from Judaism is that all of this is the final command. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's woman, my English says wife, or male or female enslaved person, slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I want you to be really honest and take a minute to envision your neighbor's house, whoever you are right now, wherever you are, and wherever you live, whether it's an apartment complex, whether you live in a yurt, or you live in some sort of, you know, out in the wilderness somewhere, and you have like, you don't even see your nearest neighbor for days, whatever the case. I want you to, I want you to picture your neighbor, whoever that is. And I want you to picture all the things that belong to your neighbor. And I want you to think of their partner. I should have prefaced that. I want you to think of a neighbor who has a partner, who has a spouse or partner. And I want you to think of everything that belongs to them and their partner as their property. So that their partner is not equal to them. Their spouse or partner isn't actually equal to them. Their spouse or partner is a part of their property. Now, how is that going to affect the way you interact with your neighbor and then with your neighbor's spouse or partner? How is that going to affect the way you think about them? How is that going to affect the way you value them, the way you might stand up to protect them, the things that you're going to think about or say or do to value and protect them? Because... Like it or not, this way of thinking is still alive and well. The reason I can say that is there is legislation being passed in the United States <laughs> that makes women property of men. So... This isn't ancient, this is current. And it started here, or it's being represented here, and people are being reared on it and taught it. And people are trying to brush it under the carpet and say, well, that's just then. But then we follow it with, with umpteen dozen stories that reiterate that women are still, that women are actually under the same label as property right? As the ox and the enslaved peoples, right? We have secondary status here for enslaved peoples. They are humans, but they're not really because they're enslaved. So they're not actually human. They're subhuman, just like the woman is, just like the house and the ox and the, right? Garden cart and the broom and the shovels and, all right, are you tracking with me here, folks? It is going to affect the way you think about people and treat them. 
It is. It just is. Okay. I'm not sure how far behind I am with the comments. I didn't, um, I didn't really track with it. <laughs> I'm enjoying the comments though. That's right, Nitty. There's no com command not to covet your neighbor's hubby because we're not ever talking to the women. That is correct. And this is a heteronormative society that these commands are coming out of, even though there's no reason to think throughout history that we haven't had the same variety of sexual sexual orientation or sexual desires that we have now. They've, those have always been present. It's just they weren't talked about. They weren't given a nod to in the stories. They weren't they weren't present at the level of text, but they were always present at the level of human experiences and, and manifestations. It's just that we don't have them talked about in the same way that male, female are, right? So that's what I mean when I say that these scriptures are coming from, at, from a heteronormative society. That's all we get to hear about our hetero couples, even though we absolutely know that there's more than just hetero happening, okay? Um, yeah. I mean, that's a great way to summarize that these these commands are not to the whole community. These commands are to the other men, right? Because nobody's talking about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. I um, I told myself I was going to try not to do too much rambling today, um, so that you so that people don't get annoyed that I'm just talking just to talk. Um, so. That's it for the, the 10 commandments. Again, I put 10 in air quotes because the different Judaism between Judaism and the various traditions of Christian, the cr Christian uh, branches, right? Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, they all talk about the 10 commandments differently. Just a, just a nod to the fact that even though it's in here, it's in these scriptures, various traditions themselves are reading the scriptures differently. So just, you know, the first set of ideas. And then allegedly the next set of the laws that we'll start reading on, on Thursday um, are just teasing these out in various ways. And they are all still ma male oriented. So they're focused on men, focused on men's needs. And when they bring up women, it's very clear that women are still, still property of men, whether it's daughters or the women that they're trying to purchase and so forth. So we'll look at the first half of those on Tuesday and the, excuse me, Thursday and the rest of them on next Tuesday. And um, let's see, let me finish out chapter 20 and then we'll call it a day. So that's the last command is you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's woman or male or female slave, enslaved person or ox or donkey or anything that bring, that belongs to your neighbor. All of those things, all of the things. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. So many things I'd like to say, but I need to keep moving to stay focused. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. I just want to cancel that out. There are so many people who have been traumatized and hurt by that, by just that. God is testing you, putting the fear of God in you, and trying to keep you from sinning. I, I feel like that is just, that's the summation of the things I'd like to challenge and undo for people. <laughs> Look at that. And the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. The Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, you have seen for yourselves that I spoke with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver alongside me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. You need make for me only an altar of earth and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your offerings of well-being, your sheep and your oxen in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you. Brr. But if you make for me an altar of stone, do not build it of hewn stones. For if you use a chisel upon it, you profane it. Right. You shall not go up by steps to my altar so that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. I just, it's so random. I just have to, it's so random. 
your nakedness. We'll come back to that shortly when we get to Leviticus. Your nakedness is your, I mean, for men, it's, you know, it's the jewels. It's the whole package, right? Don't want, don't want your, you know, your goods being exposed on the steps to the altar. I, how short are their ropes? I don't know. I just, all kinds of questions. <laughs> We'll pick up there on Thursday. Thanks for joining me. Um, I hope there's been something useful in this engagement with the commandments, the first set of commandments given given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Thanks for joining me live. I love it that there are people here joining me live who can and who are able to and want to. And for those of you who watch it later, thank you for that as well. Um, <clears throat> take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time. <laughs>